what would you like to see change in your life? And what is the biggest obstacle that you're facing now? I run a five-week program at the Inner Knowing School for serious individuals who are ready to take the next step in their personal and professional lives. I will personally be coaching a small group of individuals, a number of practical tools and frameworks for creating an intuition practice and for self-mastery. You can find more at theinnerknowingschool.com. I have a master certification in intuition medicine, and I've condensed 10 plus years of experience and research navigating how to harness your energy and intuition in an easy to access live curated course. Now, as someone who's helped countless creatives, entrepreneurs, and many who are just plain stuck, open doors of possibility they never thought existed, I've seen this strategy transform people's interstates and external reality. And the best part is that you'll skyrocket your output and unlock your creative genius. I'll work with you weekly live to overcome your limiting beliefs and show you how to manage your energy instead of your time. I'll teach you how to create clarity, processes, develop your intuition based on some of the top tools and frameworks that I've developed, and you'll get access to guided meditations and visualizations not available anywhere else. This method is so effective that even if you don't have that much time or if you think that you might not be ready, this will work for you. You can check out the link in the show notes to join the waiting list, and you can check out what past clients had to say about the program. Wishing you all many blessings ahead. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Blood Moon Box a monthly subscription box service for period pads and tampons to help support all humans who have a cycle for that time of the month and no need to run to a store to mix and match period supplies that don't cater to the entire ebbs and flows of your cycle. There are two box options based on your cycle, light and medium, and then heavy. And in addition to the period products, you'll also receive PMS herbal teas, a candle, and some other items for your time of the month. You can reserve a box by navigating to bloodmoonbox.com. And bloodmoonbox.com is on a mission to destigmatize the idea of period blood. At Blood Moon Box, they believe that it is the time to honor the enchanting magic within every person who has a cycle. So join us in embracing the magic of your cycle with Blood Moon Box. Hi, my name is Yasmin Terehi, and this is Gateways to Awakening, where we host one-on-one conversations with leading experts in wellness, well-being, and spirituality. On today's episode, I speak with Thomas More, the author of The Eloquence of Silence and 24 other books about bringing soul to our personal lives and culture, including the number one New York Times bestseller, Care of the Soul. He's also been a Catholic monk and university professor and is also a psychotherapist that has been influenced mainly by Jung and James Hillman, who I also love. His work brings together spirituality, mythology, depth psychology, and the arts emphasizing the importance of images and imagination. I'm so excited to welcome Thomas to the show. So welcome to the show, Thomas. Thank you very much, Yasmin. So to kick it off, Thomas, you know, your work really emphasizes the importance of connecting with a soul. And, you know, what is the definition of the soul? And, you know, how do you suggest people go about kind of cultivating this connection? Well, it's hard to define what the soul is because it's quite mysterious. But I think we could say that it has to do with the the depth of our experience. Uh, when a person is in touch with their soul, they they really are in touch with life. And uh, what they say comes from their heart. And they're able to connect with other people and to the world around them. And um, they, uh, they're they not uh, machine-like, you know, they're, they're really very human. The ancients, the ancient writers said that the soul makes us human. Uh, the spirit gives us transcendence that allows us to get beyond our humanity, but the soul gives us our humanity. Mm. What about for people that, you know, don't really know what that means or have never felt really connected to their soul? I mean, I think a lot of people 
maybe walk through life without that connection. And I'm curious, you know, what do you say to people who don't have that ex- or have never had that experience or don't understand uh, what a soul is? Well, I asked them to spend some time with me and uh, over time to get a deeper sense of what this is all about, because it's, uh, as I say, it's you, you can't just define it and and make statements about it. You have to have the experience to some extent. And um, I think that, uh, you know, people, like you say, there are people who, who just live their lives and they don't worry about uh, something like that, that I would call a soul. So um, what I do in all my books, I've tried to be, I've tried to use traditional ideas I, I rarely write just from the top of my head. You know, most of it is is uh, uh, conveying ideas from the past, from uh, very special resources in the past. And I try to make them easy to read and to understand. I do my best to do that. So uh, that's my job, is to try to make these these rather d- difficult and, and deep ideas to make them accessible. Uh, but I think the average person... Uh, you know, people just wake up sometimes and they think, well, there's more to life than this. And and uh, they they want, if they want to go further, then we can go further. But if they don't, then I don't think that I can have much of a conversation with them. Right, right, right. Makes sense. So I want to talk a little bit about care of the soul before we get into the eloquence of silence, because I think that for me at least felt like a very powerful foundation, you know, about the connection with the soul. And I I felt very moved by the book. You share, you know, that many of our modern problems kind of start with like this lack of attention to our connection to our spiritual dimensions of life. And so what are some ways that you or approaches that you can like recommend for indiv- individuals um, to really in- address this? Like what, what would you say to someone um, who wants to start like a practice to connecting with their spirituality? Uh, well, I, I think the first thing is the, what a lot of people have to do is they have to look at their past. You know, they have to see where they're coming from. And uh, I think today an awful lot of people are uh, have different attitudes towards, let's say, their family uh, values about uh, spirituality. Um, today, many people still have been brought up in a very literal, uh, moralistic, religious environment. And that really is a tough thing. I, I, I talk to a lot of people who are able to free themselves from that. But it's not easy because it's entangled with family feelings, you know, so people don't want to uh, offend their families or get distance from their families. And at the same time, they realize that, uh, or they may be waking up to the fact that there's uh, there's a better way to think about all those things. So that, it's difficult uh, for people today. I think that's what I'm trying to say about the relationship to the family background. And once, if people can deal with that and try to move on in their own way, they have to find some good resources, I think. That's what people do. They tend to search for a good teacher or a, a good a good ideas, maybe a good approach, a tradition that, that would be comfortable for them. There are, all, there are many different ways to do it. You know, people become, they convert, they become Jewish or, you know, or Catholic or uh, Muslim or something, they, they convert to a different idea. That's one way to do it. Another is to keep searching and take different ideas from different resources. That's also very common today. I think all of those ways of doing it are appropriate. And a person has to know who they are and what's right for them. It really would help to get some guidance, but that's not easy to find. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, in some of the past work you've done, you've also written about the role of mythology in our lives. And so how does mythology play a role in modern society today? You know, how can we use mythology in our own lives? Well, when I wrote Care of the Soul, I used quite a bit of mythology there. I don't do it so much in my more recent books. Um, I think that uh, at that time, anyway, for me personally, mythology was a really good 
way of getting deeper into different aspects of of life. Uh, Mythology tells great stories of the powers in life, like let's say the mythologies around uh, Aphrodite or Venus about are about uh, love and beauty and sexuality and then there's a there's a mythology around uh, uh, the goddess Diana or Artemis and that those stories are mainly about uh, living your own life and uh, not giving up too much to anybody else uh, and to sort of protect your own integrity. So those are two different, very interesting, potent aspects of life that myth allows us to examine and think about. I don't know if there are other sources that are so good, as good as mythology, to to appreciate these powers that that flow through us and that come to us. It's like our, our let's say, our sexuality is not is not really ours to make up and create. We it's a power in human life. And we have to come to grips with it and deal with it creatively. And I think myth lets us see that. Uh, to just to talk about these things in the abstract doesn't give us enough depth uh, and a, a sense of the power of these, these aspects of our daily experience. What uh, myth maybe has moved you in your own kind of personal journey, Thomas? Well, that's really a good question. You know, uh, my, one of my great friends, James Hillman, talked about polytheism in his work, psychological polytheism, meaning that we have many things going on in us, not just one. So I have, I've had to deal with the, the uh, what would you say, not the conflict, but the, the contradictions that appear in, in different myths. For example, I feel that I was born with a strong Artemis spirit. Uh, Artemis has a lot of boys, young men around her, and I feel like that's who I am. I'm one of those young men who's been around the Artemis spirit all my life. And um, it's a kind of not belonging. You know, I'm not, I don't really belong much to groups. Um, I wouldn't say I'm I, I'm uh, asocial, but uh, maybe in that direction, you know, I... I uh, <laughs> I like to be alone, and I like uh, I like quiet, and so that Artemis spirit in me is very strong. On the other hand, um, I really love to be in community and with people, although I'm not the one who will create it. You know, I'm not the kind of person who will put, who will have a party. You know, I I just don't do it. It's not who I am. I'm so Artemis like. But um, on the other hand, I want that in my life. And of course, uh, the sensuality and the beauty and the sexuality that is part of the goddess Aphrodite is very different. That too is very important to me. And for me, one of the challenges in life is to get these two great powers together so that I can live them both and and uh, not have too much difficulty in getting them together. So that is like looking at my life uh mythologically, sort of psycho-mythologically, if you can put those two things together. Wow. Fascinating. I love that you called out uh, Artemis specifically, because I identify very closely with uh, her as an archetype, I would say. Yeah, a big (laughs) connection. Um, Uh Yeah, and I think, you know, I've always been really curious about the process, like the creative process for writing, you know, a book, and you've written 24, so I can imagine that there's probably a lot of time of solitude, right? Spending a lot of time uh, writing and then also being in community to get feedback or bounce ideas off of. And uh, I'm really uh, so in awe of your relationship with James Hillman. I'm a big fan of his as well. So mm-hmm. um, I'm curious like how your relationship with him has influenced your own journey. Well, he influenced me a great deal. First of all, with his ideas, we met... Uh, we didn't. We actually started our our connection, our friendship, uh, when he was living in Europe, in Switzerland, and we had we had a long correspondence. We we exchanged letters, and he was printing things, publishing things in article form, and he would send them to me. and And then when we met, we we lived in the same city for about uh, five or six years, and we were together a great deal. So he influenced me a lot. Whenever, whatever he looked at, whatever he picked up, like an ordinary, 
experience. He would look at it in such a fresh way. He would startle me constantly by being able to look at the most ordinary things with a fresh eye. And I thought, wow, that was just amazing. I, I was very uh, enlivened by it. And for a while, I think that happens with someone like that. They influence you so much that it's hard to separate your own thoughts from theirs. So it took me a while. But now, at this point, I have uh, the distance. And I, I appreciate his, him very, very much. But uh, I'm also realizing that I'm moving in my own direction and creating my own thing. So uh, he was a great gift to me. Uh, he was... Um, he took uh, the work of Carl Jung, which has also been very important to me, and he moved it in new directions. That was important because I, I never really wanted to be a Jungian uh, psychologist. I felt that I might get uh, trapped in another religion, you know, kind of a devotion <laughs> to Jung. And I, I really, I, I, I resist that. I was a monk. I figured I'd pay my dues. You know, that's enough. <laughs> um, but I but I read Jung constantly, and I I'm, you know I I I I think the more time goes on, I value everything he did, but I don't value so much what you would find in a summary of his work. You know the sketches they they publish all over the place of what his psychology is. I I like Jung, who is the the quirky person who observe makes these observations that are so interesting and insightful and it was that quality in Hillman that I appreciated and I try to do that myself I I work very hard to get an insight and a lot of people read my books and they tell me what great musings you have there and I think to myself wow that's not how I see them I don't see them as you know musings I see these things as hard won insights I really worked hard to get these insights and to put them into the books. So it's a little difficult uh, writing. Uh, you're asking about writing. It's kind of difficult to write this kind of thing. It's hard to get the words that really convey what you want to say. The other thing I want to say about what you said is that um, it is a very private thing to write. And I, I do spend a lot of time by myself writing. I write in, late at night. I like to write in the wee hours of the morning. Um, and uh, it's a very quiet, uh, isolated time. Uh, I have friends who told me that they had to choose between being a writer or living. And I think about that a lot. <laughs> I think about that where, did I choose to be a writer and not live? I, I don't think so, but there is some truth to that, that uh, I probably would have traveled more and maybe done more things if I didn't spend so much time writing, but I love it. Like today, I have this book has just come out now, uh, The Eloquence of Silence. And it just came out today. I can't wait till t for tomorrow to start a new book. You know what I mean? It, <laughs> it's like a disease or an illness. So I really don't feel like I have a choice of whether I can write or not. That's what I've chosen to do. But, but my writing at the same time has been a... Uh, it, what, what's the word, like a ticket or like a key or something where it has opened up a lot of, uh, of contact with the world to me. So I have people reading my books all over the world and I give talks now on Zoom all over the world. And I, like recently I gave a, ta a lecture to uh, uh, Jungians in, in Moscow and it was so important to me to do that, to to be able to to speak to people who are going through a lot in that place and to talk about my ideas of how they might be able to uh, take Jung in a direction that will be useful to them. I have my own ideas about that. So in a way, the writing has actually allowed me to be more social in certain ways. So I have extremes where I, I'm out there so much talking to people and teaching. And at the same time, I spend so much time alone doing the writing. Mm, fascinating. I'm so intrigued by the process of coming up with, you know, kind of a thesis on a subject and then, you know, bringing it to completion. So, uh, you know, before we move on to the book itself, what is your, what do you think your next topic is going to be about? Well, I'm not really sure because I have several in mind. I've got some fiction that needs to be just touched up and uh, I'd love to get that out. 
Um, I'd like to write a book on fairy tales because I've taught fairy tales for many years and I have my own, my own ideas about them. I think people are interested in them. Um, but I, right now, I think what I'm going to do is, uh, is write about uh, Henry David Thoreau. I live in New England and Thoreau was all around me here. I live in the I live right next to, if you were next to me here, you could see Mount Monadnock, which is a small mountain uh, where, Thoreau, where he, Thoreau and Emerson climbed it, and they would come out here by train and then walk up the mountain. And uh, so the transcendentalists are very interesting to me, and Thoreau in particular. I don't feel that he's really been understood as much as he, you know, in a way that I see him anyway. I'd like to be able to write a book that, that, um, it draws on his incredible uh, uh, approach to life. He really had a very unique way of, of living life and, and, and doing it. He was a naturalist, but at the same time, he was, he was a real thinker. And uh, he read a great deal, and he knew languages. And he was really an intellectual. At the same time, he was in nature all the time. And that is very interesting to me. So I'm writing this book as a as a solution to the world problems we have. I, I think that Thoreau could help us restore our humanity, which is really required today. So um, I'm very excited to write about him and, in my own way, and, and, and I can't wait to get into it. Wow. Yeah. Well, I definitely look forward to that topic. Um, and yeah, it is interesting that he is an intellectual, but also spent a lot of time in nature. And so it's sort mm -hmm. of like that bridge between the mind and the heart is kind of where I see him. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So let's talk about your latest book, because I read it and I absolutely loved it. So folks who are listening, The Eloquence of Silence is Thomas More's latest book. And it is an absolute gem, you know, and I was really struck by the way it was written too. It's like these mini kind of lessons, um, like ancient modern lessons and teachings. And I'm very curious. I was moved by many of them, some, you know, definitely more than others, uh, yeah. but all of it just really, really moved me. And I feel like that, you know, that for me is like a technique in writing that is so powerful, you know, to be so moved by words. Um, so I'm curious, you know, what was your process for selecting these types of stories, both ancient and modern, you know, for the chapters? And then we'll get into some of the stories that you shared. Yeah. Well, the the selections, I have 30 selections. Some of them are simple stories. Some of them are statements from philosophers and theologians. And some of them come from sacred texts. Um, so... For example, I, I have the entire uh, uh, the entire Heart Sutra uh, in in there and in my my own English, and uh, so w w the thing is that all of these selections, all thirty, I have lived with for many years. I didn't sit down and look for for uh, passages about emptiness that I could put into this book. I knew them. I lived them for for many years and. For example, I have a I have a passage from Teilhard de Chardin, who is a Christian scientist theologian, and uh, I w I was fired up about him when I was in my early twenties. So it's not so, so these things are not uh, are not uh, detached. You know, they're 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 passages that have meant a lot to me in my own life, and I know that not everybody will respond to some of them because they come from, you know, my life, which. I'm I'm 82 now. You know, it's it's uh, the live the life I have lived is, has almost no relationship to the modern world at this point. So, um, a lot of these passages are from another era, but uh, I think they're very relevant and exciting. So when I put them together like this, they were very familiar to me, and uh, I love them all. And, and so it was it was not an academic kind of thing. Fascinating. So, you know, I want to kick it off with uh, one of the first stories about Nestradine. I don't know if I'm pronouncing the name correctly, but Nestradine's rule, do not give away the ring on your finger. Can you tell us a little bit about that story and, you know, why did you choose that, especially to kind of yeah. kick off the book? Yeah. 
Well, I love that story. I think it's a perfect example of emptiness. Maybe I should say it before we start that when I use this word emptiness, I want to be really clear. I'm not talking about vacancy, like people say my life is empty. I don't mean that. This is a, an idea that comes from the East, from India and China and Japan especially. Um, it's a spiritual idea and it's very positive. It means not being full of yourself, like an emptying of yourself as you live. Uh, like let's say when you get married, you empty yourself of many of your uh, needs and uh, requirements on behalf of the other person. That's an emptying, which is very positive. It fosters love to do that. Or you might uh, n notice some, some things you're very attached to and you have a lot of agendas inside of you you want. You want uh, people to act in certain ways, and you want them to see you yourself in a certain way. All those inner agendas that go on in our minds when we relate to people, uh, I'm suggesting emptying yourself of those kinds of things. So it's a very positive emptying, and uh, uh, it's a spiritual emptying. Now, this story that I start with is about Nasruddin, who is, it's a, these are Sufi stories about him. Uh, and uh, he's a teacher, a spiritual teacher. And a man comes to him from his village who tells him that he has to go away, that he has to move. And he's very sorry that he has to leave Nasruddin because Nasruddin's been important to him. And he said, I've noticed that you wear this ring on your finger. And I thought it'd be very good if you would give me that ring. Then when I left, Every time I looked at the ring on my finger, I think of you. And Nasruddin, who is a kind of interesting character who takes care of himself pretty well, doesn't like to give away too much, he said, I have a better idea. He said, why don't I keep my ring? And every time you look at your finger and see that there's no ring there, you'll think of me. I think that is a really good story of... Uh, of emptiness, and it's got a little bit of humor, you know, to it, which is important for emptying too. We get you get too serious, you need it, that seriousness emptied. <laughs> so, uh, so I think it's great. So, if you, there are many instances in which uh, we would be better served by not having something than by having it, uh, and and giving away things can be very useful sometimes or not being too attached to, to things and to language and to even to certain people or ideas, uh, not, or, you know, teachers or leaders or authors, to be too attached, too attached. And you need some emptying there, some loosening up. And I think that's what Nasruddin, in a sense, in this story, he understands that. And he, he's teaching this man not just not to have a ring, but in every instance, to, to understand that sometimes nothing is better than something. You know, to not to have something gives you a deeper awareness of what's going on in life than to keep getting things and, and being, you know, possessing things. Yes, I love that concept. And I want to double click on it because uh, in one of your other chapters, I forget now exactly the, the story, but it's something along the lines of, you were looking for a job at one point as a writer, um, a sort of a technical writer. And uh, the company said that, you know, that you were too good of a writer for the job, <laughs> which I thought right. was interesting. And then you said that there was emptiness and space for something else to come through. And you're so happy that you didn't take that job because it would have really kind of, you know, broken your spirit, I think is, are the words that you used. So I love that idea. I, for, you know, the moment I read that, I just, there was such a relaxation that happened within me, you know, this idea of like, oh yeah, you don't have to fill your life or fill your schedule with things because that emptiness also opens up to more possibility, right? And more, and opportunities that are oftentimes better. So I really, really love that, that story. Yes, it's a it's a tough lesson too. Uh, I, I mean, I, I didn't feel good not getting that job, uh, but it was a good thing I didn't. You know, that would have been disaster if I had gotten that job. So there, I think the the lesson there is that about emptiness 
is that when you really want something badly, I don't care what kind of thing, it might be an object or it might be a job or it might be a person, you really want this thing and you don't get it for one reason or another, that's a real good moment to to reflect, to sit back and say, you know, what's going on here uh, that I didn't get what I wanted? Could there be something good in this? Is this something that maybe I have to sit with for a while and maybe wait and time will teach me or show me that this was a good moment, not a bad moment. So there are a lot of contradictions when you talk about emptiness and a lot of mysteries. And uh, I, I just, uh, I feel that, uh, that that experience of mine was, uh, was one that I've had other times in my life similarly. And uh, it's really, it's only later that you're able to see what's important and what isn't important. Right, right. Looking back, yeah, you just never know in the moment. It always seems like so tragic. Oh. <laughs> but yeah, it would know, be great to know in the moment, but you don't. But uh, it takes a lot of faith. But I think that's the point of the story: is that uh, emptiness may not feel good sometimes, but actually, in the long run, it's going to be fine. Right, right, absolutely. So another lesson uh, that I want would love to share on the show was the one about the question, how are you? And also the power of words. And I believe in this one you had, um, you know, you, you were referencing the question that you asked James Hillman, <laughs> how are you? And his response and how, you know, a lot of people kind of misinterpret that question or don't really take advantage of that question. So I'd love to, to ask you, you know, what is the lesson in that story? So when people ask that question, how are you? Uh, I often think to myself of my friendship with uh, James Hellman. He was he was very different from me, and we worked together many times. And it was not easy because he's kind of a tough guy, and he would demand a lot from people that he was teaching or speaking to. I'm kind of the opposite. I'm kind of a mothering type, you know, and I I take care of people's feelings, and, <laughs> and uh, so. The two of us are probably a good team that way, but it was not easy. But anyway, I would ask him sometimes, how are you doing, Jim? And he would say, he would he would launch into this thing of exactly how he felt. You know, he would say, well, I'm kind of depressed today because I really had a bad time last night. I was with these people I didn't like being with. And here I am waking up to the thoughts of this and I have to start another day. <laughs> and he would go. It wasn't like... How are you? Oh, well, I'm okay. I'm fine. He would never say that. He would always tell me exactly how he was. And I felt that was a lesson for me because, um, you know, if you're going to be, uh, if you're going to be a real person and be a person with other people, uh, it's probably a good idea to be, to be real all the time and not to get caught up in these expressions of words that are, em that are empty in the bad sense. That don't have any. That don't say anything. Uh, and uh, so the the alternative then would be to uh, not to worry about manipulating your conversation. I think that's where the emptiness, the good emptiness, comes in. There, you don't manipulate. So someone says, "How are you?" You tell them exactly how you are, and that is a, that's a free flowing interchange then. And it has the quality of emptiness to it. I, that, I hope that that's clear. That emptiness has a certain quality. It's like an openness, the naturalness. And it's not full of manipulation. It's not full of expectations and demands and trying to make people feel certain ways. It's just, it's just a, an open flow. And you just tell people exactly how you feel. Mm. Yeah, it's a powerful lesson, I think, for all of us <laughs> to really share what's happening as opposed to the blanket kind of answers that we all have and don't really mean or we mean but don't really, you know, go deeper in. So, you yes. know, I'm, I'd love to uh, also talk about this idea of having trust in life. You spoke about that in the book. You know, what is, how did that work for you? I mean, I think a lot of people who don't have trust in life um, you know, what was the bridge, I guess, for you to have this connection to maybe like the divine or, or this greater intelligence? Uh, and how has that impacted your life? Well, I grew up in an Irish Catholic family. It was very religious and, uh, you know, a lot of problems. Um, 
I never heard the word sex until I was about 25, I think. You know, it was one of those situations where there was a lot of guilt and a lot of uh, inhibition in the family. Um, on the other hand, uh, they were uh, very devout, you know, my mother and dad and my aunts, my aunts and uncles, they were all very devout. And I learned that when I was young. And even though I, I, don't, I don't practice Catholicism anymore, uh, at least not in the, in the official way, in any, any outward sense, I still feel that I'm deeply Catholic at heart, especially the way my family was. And that was there was a lot of trust in in God. They would say, "I don't use God God language anymore. I think it's 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 a big problem." So I I wouldn't say it that way, but um, I would say that I do still have a lot of faith faith in uh, in life and trust. I think faith is really trust. That's what the core of it is. So I learned that from my family. I think I learned it early on in my life. That's the only way I can understand it, because in fact, I have trusted life. Maybe sometimes I feel like I've done it naively, but actually, you know, things have turned out really well. So I, I'm, I'm happy with the, the virtue of faith that I do have and I got from my family and from their Catholicism. And it does make a big difference because um, it, I'll give you another example that I, I think I refer to in this book. I do it in almost all my books. Uh, when I was uh, teaching at a university, uh, the chairman of the department called me in one day and told me that they were going not going to give me tenure, which means you're fired, essentially. And uh, and when he said that, I thought, this funny, it's like the spark went off in my mind. I said, oh, wow, I'm freed from this now. I'm, I've got something else to do. <laughs> And I just felt the trust then, you know, what you're, what you're talking about, the trust. And he said, you can appeal this if you want. And I said, of course I can't. You know, I, I can't. You're speaking like an angel right now. You know, your voice is very powerful. You're telling me I have to move in a new direction in life. And I get it. You know, not because you yourself are telling me, but because the voice has been spoken and I, I hear it. So I'm going to go in a different direction now. And there are not going to be any appeals. And uh, I don't want to talk to you about it anymore. <laughs> wow. So, so I've had that kind of a that kind of a trust. I, I maybe that story conveys what I'm trying to say. That kind of a trust, and it really has helped me. I think throughout my life. Wow, that's really powerful. And because I was gonna, as a follow up question, I was gonna ask if your faith is ever shaken and what you do about it. But it seems like that even in, you know, these really big moments in life that you. It seems that you are still trust trusting, you know, the the divine intelligence. So, but yeah, is your faith ever shaken, Thomas? Yes, I think it is. I think, for example, these days I'm really shaken by the polarization of the citizens of America. It just really, it really, I can't believe it that you know there's such polarization, difference here, and a refusal to to come together. Uh, I, see, for me, America, I get this from the transcendentalist too, America is a, is a philosophy. It's, a, it's a, something you dedicate yourself to, not, not to a nation, but to the, the, the ideal and to, the, uh, to that spirit. And so my faith is really shaken by that these days. I don't know what to do, really. I can't believe that this is happening. So my, my faith is, does get shaken at times. Uh, on the other hand, uh, what I was going to say is that uh, I, am, I feel that I'm still a very religious person. I, don't, I, I know a lot of people don't like the word religious, but I do. You know, I have a PhD in religious studies. How could I not like the word religion? I mean, I, I like it, but I, I redefine it uh, constantly. And uh, to me, basically, religion means finding ways to relate to the great mysteries of human existence. And uh, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't use, like I said before, I don't, I don't use God language anymore at all. I, I, I think that's too limiting. And I don't look for other substitutes, really. I just, I just keep talking about, about life. And <laughs> I, I don't look for another way of saying that. But, um, 
the faith is still there. That's what I'm getting at here. The faith is still there, but it's not cloaked in the language and the constructions of a traditional religion. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, yeah, I appreciate that. It's like without the marketing. <laughs> so. Yeah, and that's very much in the spirit of, uh, of Emerson and Thoreau and Margaret Fuller and those wonderful people of, uh, of uh, 19th century America. So, Thomas, you know, is this kind of method, would you say, for everyone, this idea of, you know, silence and emptiness? And what has been the reaction so far to people who have been, you know, cultivating more emptiness in their life? Have you heard stories from anyone who has uh, applied this into their day-to-day -day life? Well, I think, first of all, it was interesting to me that... Uh, the people who endorse this book, you know, you get you get some writer, other writers who will say some good words about it. Uh, three of them are Zen Buddhists, you know, and one of them is a, one of the leading uh, teachers of Zen Buddhism, and the others are very accomplished writers of Zen Buddhism. I really love that when that happened because uh, I didn't. I meant this book to be very serious, even though I I don't present it the way normally. Uh, emptiness would be presented in a Buddhist context, and I'm not a Buddhist at all. But uh, but I was very happy to have those endorsements by very very serious uh, Zen Buddhists, and um, uh, so you know they 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 see the value of talking about emptiness in this more common way, how we can live it in every day, and not just as an abstract idea. Uh, so that that's very good. And the other thing is that. The, all the feedback I'm getting, it's not, the book is just out today, but people have heard about it and read it uh, in previous, you know, or in the early uh, forums. And all the feedback I'm getting, I'm surprised. It's very, very positive. People, people uh, say this is really, really something that they want to think about and they want to see how they can bring it into their lives. And they kind of glimpse it without understanding it fully. They glimpse that this is something worthwhile. I love that. It's like planting seeds within the subconscious too, yeah, I yeah, think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, Thomas, what attracted you to this space? And can you tell us about your own journey of writing about these types of topics of, you know, the soul? I also love the introdu introduction um, in The Eloquence of Silence when you talked about uh, the reaction of your first book, Care for the Soul. But yeah, tell us about your journey, you know, Walk us through why why you decided to devote so much of your life to this work. Well, uh, I really, uh, I, I don't know where it came from. Really, honestly, I don't know where it came from. It's like my daughter. You know, my daughter, uh, her name is, uh, as a performer, is Ajit, or she uses her real name of Siobhan. And uh, she's she, she performs all over the world, and she makes some absolutely gorgeous music, I think. And I'm a musician. I'm a composition major. I think I know music. And she really writes good music. And where that came from, I have no idea. You know, where that came out of her. Uh, when she was, I, I homeschooled her when she was a kid. but uh, And I, I taught her piano. And, but I didn't teach her all this stuff that she's able to do today. And so where does it come from? I feel that my writing all these books came from somewhere like that. I don't know where it came from. It just it just grows out. It's like it's like weeds in the sidewalk, you know, where you don't want them and they just keep growing. <laughs> That's what it was. Uh, I had friends who were really good writers, and I always thought they were going to be the successful writers, and I was just going to be a teacher. I never thought of myself being a professional writer. But now I, I can't think of anything else. I love it. I love writing so much. I have a great passion for it. And uh, so I always feel in it that whatever I write is inadequate. I, I mean, I love passages that I write, but in, I also I find many things that I wish I had I, I could redo. But at the same time, I have great passion for the writing, and I don't know where it came from. And I don't even want to use language for it. I don't want to talk about that. I think when you start talking about where these things come from, your your language gets gooey, you know, mm -hmm. and kind of yeah. uh, imprecise and wishful. I, I don't like to talk about it. I just and I, I appreciate that it's happening, and I hope it continues to to flow. 
Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, why do you think that this subject and talking about the subject is important right now? It's important because we don't have a lot of intelligence in this world at the moment, you know, like life intelligence, how to live and how to deal with people and how to resolve our problems. We don't have much. Politicians, the way they talk to each other is so stupid, you know, it's so immature, it's hard to believe. And in the realm of spirituality, which, you know, I, I know fairly well, um, I think if there's anything that characterizes it today is a lack of intelligence. We used to have theologians, you know, the, the, theologians who thought things through and gave us good ideas for our spiritual lives. Today, we don't have much thinking. We have a lot of emotion and uh, we're swept away by ideas and images, but I don't think we have much reflection that like theological and t intellectual spiritual reflection. Um, when I spent a lot of time in Ireland, I just got back a few days ago from Ireland and I've uh, I was there for a month, and I, I've been going all my life. And, you know, the Irish monks uh, f uh, fashioned their spirituality, which is wonderful and very earthy, but they were very intellectual, those Irish monks. And their main uh, their main possession, their prized possession, were their books. And their, uh, their way of life was to study. Study was a very important part of the way of life. Would you say that about contemporary spirituality? I don't think so. Do you go, you find some great spiritual leader today, do they show you their library? They don't, you know. In, in the past, libraries were the great uh, sacred places in a monastery. And today we don't, we don't understand study. When I was a monk, we, I was taught that study was a form of prayer, that it was very important for me to study as a monk. And I did. And I, I still have that and uh, that practice, that, that habit. So this discourages me about the world today that uh, we don't have the intelligence we need to be able to deal with our problems. And I really don't know what's going to happen. I'm very concerned. Mm. Yeah. Wow. I love that uh, study is a form of prayer. I never heard that before. It's uh, That's powerful. And I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think... I also feel like I my library is my very prized <laughs> possession, mm -hmm. but I think it's mm -hmm. very rare. I don't think a lot of people read uh, as much as I think we need to, um, to really have exposure to all of the things kind of playing out right now in culture and, and also borrow lessons from the past. Um, so what sort of things have surprised you the most on this journey, Thomas? Well, the twists and turns in my personal life have really shocked me. Uh, first of all, I left to become a monk. I left when I was 13 years old. That's quite a shock. You know, I, I'm still homesick from all that. Um, but I was, I was just uh, captivated. I just had to do that. And I understand it differently now. I, I feel that it, at the time I was, I left home so I could become a Catholic priest. Now I see it that I left home so that I could uh, immediately get going on this life of what you were talking about, soul and spirit, of, uh, of being able to focus on these things instead of some other issue in life. And that was just my fate. That's my destiny. And uh, I am I was shocked every part of the way. So when I left the monastery, I was surprised. I wasn't confused. I, I was absolutely certain I, I had to leave. but. I was shocked because my intention was to stay with it the rest of my life. And uh, and then I was shocked when I became a professor because I loved teaching university. I loved that. And I loved having the library of the university next to me. That was really a big part of it. Um, and then to be told that I, I wasn't teaching in the way they wanted and uh, or writing the way they wanted, and they asked me to leave, I... I was shocked. That was a real shock to me personally. So, um, and I'm also shocked in a bigger way that uh, uh, as I, I started out being so devoted to the Catholic tradition, and now to see them uh, supporting uh, ex almost exclusively uh, uh, 
values that, are, that are, to me are inhuman, inhumane, and uh, they've just lost it as far as I'm concerned. That's a shock to me and a surprise. And a, I feel like there's nothing I can do about it because they're, they're not interested in me at all because I'm, you know, I'm, I've gone in the opposite direction. Right, right. Wow. It's so, you know, this is so powerful. I, I'm also curious, Thomas, you know, what as a message to our audience, like what is your main takeaway? If you look back on your life's work, uh, incorporating this book and maybe future books to come, and what do you, what do you want to tell our audience? Like what's your kind of main call to action? Uh most of my my life, I have been interested in, even, even when I was very young, even in my teens, I was interested intellectually in getting uh, spirituality and worldliness together. I felt that it's very important to have a very worldly life, to really have the great, enjoy the pleasures of life and not to be denying yourself all the time. I, I think that's kind of dumb. It's I think there's a lot of ego in self-denial. I don't I don't trust it. And so uh, I've been trying really most of my life and all my work to bring uh, everyday worldly life, human life, together with a very transcendent spirituality, the highest you can get. I think you can go as high as you want as long as you're grounded in your everyday life and in your family and your home and your pleasures and play and games and uh, good food and uh, fellowship. And I mean, I shouldn't say fellowship. I didn't use that word more than friendship and, and neighborhood, things like that. Um, Those are the things that I think are so important. Uh, Theoretically, that means getting soul and spirit together. Spirit moves high away from this earth in a way. And that's very important to, transcend on the other hand if you transcend and you lose your 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 family and you lose your uh your enjoyment of life and uh, you know the, your your body and the material world if you lose all that then you know you've lost everything so i've tried in all my work it's under it underlies everything to be worldly and spiritual intensely do both mm. i call myself a Epicurean. I have written books saying that Jesus was an Epicurean. An Epicurean means someone who loves worldly pleasures. Not not extreme and not entertainments and not superficially, but deep human pleasures of uh, you know eating together with friends and family and uh, uh, having a good home that people want to come to, you want them what they want to visit, of uh, playing as much as you do serious work in your life. Of having a really good sense of humor, all of these things to me are part of the whole picture. You cannot look at what we call a spiritual life if you don't include all of that all the time without any exception. Yes, that's such a powerful point. I think, you know, this idea idea of like a spiritual identity, I think oftentimes people take on which oftentimes just feels like anti-human, right? Like there's yes. no way, right? <laughs> so uh, yeah, I could not agree with you more. I think in, in many respects, I'm also an Epicurean. <laughs> I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's good to have fun and also be on the path, right? It's not, those yes. are not mutually exclusive. <laughs> um, yeah. So, okay, so Thomas, where can people find your book? Where can we find other books that you've written or anything else that you're up to? I actually, I have at this point, I think thirty-two books out. If you count my translations of the Gospels, which I do, um, so uh, they're everywhere. You can get them wherever books are sold. You can get them eventually. I, of course, I always recommend going to your local physical bookstore. They, they, they are such an important presence in a community. So, um, I, I'd suggest if you want to order a book, go to your bookstore and order it. And you can get any of my books that way. I think most of them are in print. I think there may be one, maybe two out of print, but but most of them are available. And then my, if I remember correctly, you you gave my website thomasmoresoul dot com. Uh, that's where um, more information is there. And also, I teach a course online, which is a re- much deeper approach to all of these things. And uh, 
takes a year to, to get through it all. And that's available and details are on my website. Um, I don't, I think that's about it. Amazing. Okay. And we'll include all the links in the show notes so that people can find you easily and find your thank books you. and your work. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Well, Thomas, thank you so much for your time. This has been so lovely. And for those listening, definitely go and check out The Eloquence of Silence at your local bookstore. It is a gem of a book. And I am just so delighted to have had this opportunity to connect with you, Thomas. Well, thank you, Yasmin, for uh, a, a really a wonderful conversation. I mean, uh, it's just great the way you um, you enter this, all of this, and uh, and lead and follow, and it's like a dance. Very, very good. <laughs> thank you. Very much. Oh, thank you so much, Thomas. And for our audience, thanks for joining and for listening. In this episode, we learned about the eloquence of silence and how to connect with your soul through silence with Thomas Moore. And you can tune in to Gateways to Awakening, where we host one-on-one -on -one conversations with leading experts in wellness, well-being, and spirituality. Thanks again. <music>